That is my cue when that ends, right? Good morning, Tom. Good morning to all of you. You might need to drop that down just a little bit, Christian. Thank you. And I'm going to drop the mic in a minute here. So, no. um, Good to see everyone. Uh, I'm going to, let's get started right away, but I'm going to have you stand. Uh, and I'm going to probably give you two songs after that to sit down. Because this is a long version of this song. This is the first time we've used the Praise and Harmony one. So get ready. Not on the video, the, oh, I'm sorry. I've done it again. Go ahead and be seated. And let's watch this video. My fault. Go ahead, Christian. Now, remember all that that I said, let's stand real quick for this one. I do like one line out of that, I like a lot of it, but let's remember, it's time to tell the story. I like that. It's time to tell the story. All right. Christian. I'm willing to turn his gates with thanksgiving in my heart. I'm willing to turn his cause with praise. I will say this is the day. seated. I did see you guys working on that. Christian, let's drop the main the, down just a little bit. Check, check, check. Okay, some. Okay. God of wonders. Guys, we started off. Lord of all creation. Lord of all creation. 
Randy. Good morning. My name is Randy Yeager. I'm one of the shepherds here at South Hills Church of Christ. I'd like to welcome you all who are here personally and those who are attending virtually this morning. Welcome to our worship service. For those of you who are visiting, you'll find in front of you in the pews uh, two cards. One of them is a visitor card. We're asking you if you would fill that out and put it in the basket at the rear. And if you do not run out the door but walk and we have a chance to greet you, Scott has a gift for you if you are visiting that we would like to, like to pass along to you. Also, the other card is our prayer card. We are a church of prayer. We believe in the power of prayer. And I'm encouraging all of you, if you have prayer needs, to fill out a card and, again, drop it in the basket at the rear. By way of announcement this morning, uh, teen night, August 3rd, which is tomorrow evening, 7 o'clock at the building, downstairs. Uh, I don't know the age limit on teen night. Christian, what have you got for that? High schoolers, okay. Not junior high, but high schoolers. All right, high schoolers for teen night for the movie. Uh, our Mission State, our Mountain State Children's Home uh, donation cans are out in the lobby. If you'd like to take one, they are due in October. I encourage all of you to grab one and fill it with your change and between now and then and turn it back in at that point in time. Women's Prayer Gathering Thursday night will be this Thursday evening here at the church building at 7 p.m. downstairs. If you have any questions, you can contact Annette. And Young Adult Gathering on Thursday, August 20th, which is uh, several weeks away yet, but at 6 a.m. at the Falkowski's home, and that was a great success last time. Oh, 6 p.m.? Oh, I, I say 6 a.m.? <laughs> I've been getting up so early in the morning that 6 a.m. sounds normal for me, so... <laughs> But anyway, that's been a great success as well, and I encourage all the young adults to, to plan on gathering for that. Uh, thank you, thank you, thank you to the members of this congregation for the generosity you've demonstrated in providing uh, the gift cards to the Helena Police Department. Uh, things have been so successful that we're moving forward with the police department next, and uh, hopefully before it's over, the highway patrol as well, to uh, let them know that they are appreciated and cared for by this congregation, this community. And lastly, a uh, new class started this morning, the Gospel of Mark, Sunday mornings at 9 a.m. via Zoom. Uh, encourage all of you to participate in that. It's a great class, and uh, you'll have the uh, opportunity to be tortured by me next week as Scott is going to be on vacation, and so I've volunteered to lead for a week, and so uh, hopefully I won't uh, set us back too far in doing so. Uh, I think that includes us for our announcements. Oh, Jerry. Thank you, Jerry. Yeah. Let's pray. Merciful God, loving Father, we praise you and thank you for the gift of this beautiful day, for the ability to come together to worship and to lift our voices and our praise to you. You are a God that is worthy, a God that is complete and whole, and Father, we desire your presence here this morning as we, uh, as we do worship and we do sing our praises and our thanksgiving to you. We think, lift these things to you in the name of your Son. It's in his name we pray. Thanks, Randy. A couple of songs as we prepare to partake of communion together this morning. I stand in awe and in Jesus, only Jesus. Go ahead, Chris.
seated. Go ahead. Who has the power to raise the dead? Who can save us from our sin? He is our hope, our righteousness. Jesus, only Jesus. Who can make the blind to see? Who holds the keys that set us free? He paid it all to bring us peace. Jesus. Hi there. Morning. So, interesting thing. I'm a, Ralph gave me the suggestion on this. Masks. He read a translation. I can't find it in New England or New England. New Living Translation or the uh, NIV. So, maybe there is a New England one out there. But anyway, uh, which reminded me of uh, something that maybe six months ago was common we walk outside you know how's the weather so you meet somebody for the first time what used to be the greeting right hey what do you think about this weather right or a little in the conversation and stuff like that no we don't have that now it's masks are you for or are you against um yeah i'm standing in you know store late at night nobody's around and gal's got a face face shield on and there's a the plastic and she's looking at me don't you have a mask and i'm looking at like you have two layers of protection there. I just, yeah. Anyway, so with that being said, um, we're not going to get all into that uh, anymore. So we have uh, the word, right? And out of this, I tried to find, like I said, more on the mask, but it was talking about pretending and stuff. So in Colossians, uh, what is it, 12, or excuse me, 3, 12 through 15, therefore as God's chosen people, and body and dearly loved, clothe yourselves with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Bear with each other and forgive one another. If any of you has grievance against someone, forgive as the Lord has forgiven you. And over all these virtues, put on love, which binds them all together in perfect unity. So as we prepare our hearts for the Lord's table and stuff, let's just remember who we're here to serve as we take 
part of this bread. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, as we gather together in the breaking of this bread to remember the broken body of Jesus and the hope of our salvation, it's in your powerful, mighty name we pray. Amen. Do I have to give instructions on this? for the cup. Holy and righteous God, as we take this cup in remembrance of the blood that was spilled for our sins, that washes us white as snow before you, Father. And until we drink anew with you again, Jesus, amen. I'm not a fan of the masks either. Um, I have seen some pretty in, in, ingenious ones that have been made up, though, some very pretty ones. But still, they make my face feel like they're molding. <laughs> but that was our Lord's Supper, and now we're going to talk about, well, I liked what Galatians 9, 6, was it? That, that said, uh, do not weary of doing good. If you know of somebody that needs help, give them help. This is part of our commandment, actually, from God, is to help our brothers and sisters who are in need. And also to, to give to the church or give to back to God. He, he's given so graciously to all of us. Um, and, and there's some people now that are suffering and could use a hand. So be aware of your neighbors your friends, and just the people, people about you that may need a hand. We have a basket back there uh, for, for the collection, but uh, let's, let's just say a prayer about where our hearts are. Our gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you for your love, and we pray you put that love in our hearts. A generous love, Father, one to reach out to those that need a hand and to give generously to where we need to be given, not only of ourselves, but of money to cover bills and expenses. Father, we just thank you for your son, and we've seen the generosity that you have by giving us your only son, who willingly died for us. We thank you, Father. In his name we pray. Amen. So let's sing He is Exalted and then I'll turn it over to Scott. He is exalted, the King is exalted on high. I'll praise Him. He is exalted forever, exalted and I will praise His name. He
little, uh, little yellow dot on that one. You threw me off. <laughs> That's the DVDs. I can't get one oh, of them. Okay. <laughs> Morning, everybody. My name is Scott Falkowski. I'm the preaching minister here at South Hills, and I just want to say welcome as well, uh, especially to those who continue to be here from Bakersfield, have a safe trip back, uh, people who come all the way from Arizona, way in the back. So if you have something nice to say to me, my parents are back there. If not, you can go over by Dave. But uh, it's good to see you all this morning. Um, I know my folks uh, are pretty happy to be here uh, in our heat wave to get away from Arizona. Uh, they're actually using a space heater downstairs. So um, <laughs> it's what, 107 out there, right? 110, no monsoon, so it's not cooling down. So uh, we're glad you're here, mom and dad, especially. So we are continuing in our series called Beginnings. We've gone through the books of Acts and the books of Genesis. Uh, as we're doing this, just to see beginnings of human race, beginnings of the universe, beginnings of the church, uh, and the movement after Jesus ascended to heaven. And we've seen some pretty amazing things happen, some miraculous events, we've been challenged, we've been encouraged. But today, we're going to just watch the world get turned completely upside down. But before we do that, I want to have some fun with a couple of illusions. I always loved doing these with my students, but my point is sometimes things aren't always as they seem. So first one, and these are pretty familiar, is this a rabbit or a duck? Yes, who said yes? Yes, it is a rabbit or a duck, right? Depending on how you look at it, depending on your perspective, okay? This one's pretty famous. A young woman or an older woman? So the young woman usually pops out to people pretty easily, but the older woman, you can see that's actually her mouth where the bro or the uh, necklace is, and that's her chin underneath there. So you can see two different perspectives of the same drawing. This one, uh, this may cause you to have a headache, so turn away. But uh, the elephant, where are the legs, right? If you follow what should be the natural position of the legs, then you get thrown off because they're actually next to it. Anyway, so. That's just to kind of get us started for our topic of today. What happens, and we can all relate to this, when your world gets completely turned upside down? How do you react? What do you go to? Who do you go to? How do you navigate those times when things are difficult? When things aren't what they seem, what you hoped they would be, when they're definitely not like the summer that was a year ago? And so in these times, it's times to trust God and to have faith that he is with us no matter what happens in our world. It's the truth, but it's a deep truth. Before we dig in, let's pray. God, thanks for this opportunity to dig into Acts chapter 10. Powerful, powerful passage as we're reintroduced to Peter and watch his reaction when his world is not what he thinks it is. And also for Cornelius, this strong man of faith who is seeking after you. May we see ourselves in these stories. May your Holy Spirit teach us to have faith and trust in you and know that you are with us and that we can navigate the difficult times that we are in. As we talked about in our Mark, you know, the wilderness experiences that we're in right now. Thank you for your son, Jesus Christ. In his name we pray, amen. So just a quick question, um, this, isn't, uh, this is more rhetorical at this point, it just kind of gets us going. So if you had an encounter with an angelic being and you were told the most incredible news, what would you do next? Okay, I mean some of us, we really have to imagine what would that be like, hearing that voice, having a messenger, having an angel come to us. But what would you do? What would be your priority after that? And so that's what we're going to see in Cornelius. He does it right. And so there's a lot of verses in this particular passage. We're going to go through most of them, but then I'll summarize a few. But it's so important. We kind of have to have the whole context, so that's why we're going to dig in. So hopefully you have your Bibles. Turn to Acts 10, verse 1. So in the beginning it says, At Caesarea there was a man named Cornelius, a centurion in what was known as the Italian regiment. So a couple very important things already. So, uh, this area of Caesarea is a very important town. It's actually a port that Herod the Great built. We talked about him before. 
He had these incredible building projects. He would build a summer home, a spring home. He actually moved a mountain, and that's actually one of Jesus' teachings. You can move a mountain if you have faith. He actually moved a mountain because he didn't like the location of it, rebuilt the mountain, and put his palace on top of that. He did tons and tons of building projects in his 30-plus year reign. And so one of the important ones is this port at Caesarea. So that's what it looks like now. But it was this huge, thriving port town that he took advantage of and the Romans took advantage of because this was the main seaport for travelers through the Mediterranean. So a lot of money flowed through Caesarea. So for our centurion to be put in charge of 100 men, and he's also part of the Italian regiment, born Roman, born Italian, this is a very important individual, a very key individual to our story. So that sets us up with our context. So let's keep going. Verse 2, he and all his family were devout, so not Christ followers yet, but were devout and God-fearing. They had heard from the Jewish population around them about God, and they had started to pursue God and had a faith in God. Remember, this is a Roman, a hated Gentile Roman centurion who is a devout follower of God. And it says an entire family was as well. And here's some of the things he did. He gave generously to those who had need. And he prayed to God regularly. All right, so here is someone who is pursuing God with all of his heart, but he doesn't have the whole picture yet. Does this sound like somebody we just talked about in chapter 9? Saul is pursuing God with his entire heart and body and soul and mind, but he doesn't quite know the whole picture yet. So it's interesting how those two follow each other. And so one day at about three in the afternoon, he had a vision. He distinctly, Luke puts that word in there, distinctly, make no bones about it. This is definitely what he saw. Not a, oh, I think I saw this, or oh boy, I had some spicy barbecue, and whoa, I think I saw this, okay? He distinctly saw an angel of God who came to him and said, Cornelius. Cornelius stared at him in fear. What is it, Lord? He asked. Okay, so here I kind of have to ask a question just for fun. What is it about angels that whenever they show up, at least in the Gospels, people fear, right? Don't we often have images of this? lovely blonde cherub floating around, or if you like me and you like Night at the Museum or Night at the Smithsonian, the Jonas Brothers going around with their harps playing beautiful melodic music. But yet every time the angel shows up, in the Gospels especially, there is fear, and we have to really have that picture in our minds. Now, of course, if I get a vision, I get an angelic messenger, of course I'm going to be scared. Why? Wait, you're not human. You're not what I'm accustomed to, but that's what he encounters, and here we have this centurion who we don't know how long he has been part of the Italian regiment, but we know that he's a trained soldier. Roman soldiers aren't scared of much, but yet he is in fear of this individual. So he says, what is it, Lord? He asks. Notice, anybody remember what Paul said in his, or Saul? Who are you, Lord? What is it, Lord? See, Cornelius' relationship with God is pretty strong. He knows this is God speaking through a messenger to him. It's kind of interesting there. So the angel answered, Your prayers and gifts to the poor have come up as a memorial offering before God. Okay? So that's an interesting thing there, too. So here's this Roman centurion, a Gentile, God-fearing individual who is sending up prayers and gifts that are arriving to God. And so, even though this is a Gentile, we're getting imagery from the Old Testament of what the offerings would look like and how they reached God, okay? Barbecue's a big thing here. Go to Sean's house, especially, okay? And you got a good piece of brisket smoking, and that aroma, oh man, you can smell it from miles around. That's what the offering imagery was like in the Old Testament. As the Levites, the priests, were offering the sacrifice, that aroma of the barbecue would rise up to God and it would be an acceptable offering. That's the language that's used. So this is the same type of thing. So even though we're talking about a Gentile, we're getting imagery of how the Jews did their sacrifices to God. It's a beautiful picture. So 
Here's the command. Now send men to Joppa. Just remember, Peter's been hanging out there. He had two healings occur there. He's kind of just refreshing himself. Bring back a man named Simon who is called Peter. He's staying with Simon the Tanner, whose house is by the sea. Okay, anybody want to hang out on the Mediterranean and oh, got to get some rest? That's what Peter's doing, but God's got other plans. When the angel who spoke to him had gone, Cornelius called two of his servants and a devout soldier. Cornelius' witness is even going through the literal ranks. Who was one of the attendants, he told them everything that had happened which also shows how much of a God-fearing individual this is. He puts himself out there to his servants and to this soldier and tells him everything and sends them off to Joppa. Okay, now, notice, and this is very important because this is going to happen in both of the visions we're going to discuss, does God say why? Kind of interesting. God doesn't give Cornelius a lot of information except, hey, go find this guy and bring him back here, okay? So, coincidentally, okay, we're going to go through the same thing with Peter on the following day and at noon. Now, it's interesting that he would head up to the top of a building in that zone, arid zone, at noon, but he's up there. Noon the following day, they were... They were on their journey and approaching the city. Peter went up to the roof to pray. He became hungry and wanted something to eat, and while the meal was being prepared, he fell into a trance. And we continue to see this in the book of Acts. God is going to speak to people in various ways. A trance, an angelic messenger. Jesus will speak to them specifically. And so here, Peter is going to receive this message, and then something weird happens. And this is where his world really starts to shift, okay? But what's fun for me, at least as I look at this, is some things never change with Peter. Peter, Peter, Peter. Here we go. He saw heaven open and something like a large sheet being let down to earth by its four corners. It contained all kinds of four-footed animals as well as reptiles and birds. Then the voice told him, get up, Peter, kill and eat. Now there are over 600 Levitical laws about things that you can and cannot do being a good Jewish kid, as Peter is. There's a number of them are dietary laws. Don't eat this, don't eat this certain hoofed animal or, you know, various bugs and things like that. And so there's a lot of different things to follow. And so Peter has done that all of his life. He is a very strict Jewish adherent to these laws. And Peter being Peter says, surely not, Lord. We heard that before too, upper room. No way would I do that, God, surely not. And then Jesus actually says, "Uh, get behind me, Satan, okay? Surely not, Lord, Peter replied. I've never, ever, 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 ever eaten anything impure, unclean. Could you possibly eat something impure, unclean by accident? Possibly. But this is Peter, okay? I have followed everything. I'm so devout. Why are you doing this to me, God? So God says a second time, do not call anything impure that God that I have made clean. And then how many times does it happen? Peter takes three. I'm sure some of you... My parents would probably say it took Scott 20 times to hear about it, okay? Takes three times, which happens a lot with Peter. This is like the third example of threes for Peter. And immediately the sheet was taken back to heaven. Okay, so at least with Peter, he gets a little bit of an idea of what's happening here. But God doesn't give him the whole picture either. So with both Cornelius and Peter, we're going to see some leaps of faith as they follow what God has told them to do. Okay, so as much as I knock Peter, he is still an incredible man of faith and a great witness. So, a couple questions. So, on our Tuesday morning study, we've been reading this book, Not a Fan, and one of the the lines, the questions that we talked about this week was, if God said go, where is one place you would not want him to send you? And we had all kinds of interesting answers, but here's what I want to ask with regards to Peter. Like Jonah, so Jonah is told to go to the Ninevites, and he says, no way, Lord, I'm going the complete opposite direction. He even talks about, you should not save these individuals. They are not worth saving. It's pretty harsh language. So Jonah is saying, I won't go there, God. He ends up going there. But is there an individual or group you would be reluctant to share the good news with? Don't answer, okay? But just think about that. Are there biases? Are there you know, things that would cause you to, 
and not want to do. I remember one opportunity I had when I was at the King's Academy. We had a mission down at Skid Row, and we would actually take our high schoolers down to Skid Row in Los Angeles, where it is the largest homeless population in the country. They actually have taken over, and the city's allowed this, uh, taken over many, I think it's 50 blocks, okay? And that's called Skid Row. There's a, some tremendous ministry going on down there, but it's a difficult place to go. I went there and led a team of 10th, 11th, and 12th graders through Skid Row, passing out things and talking to people about Jesus. It was definitely not a comfortable place for me to go, I'll just be honest, okay? But, you know, I went. There are other places where I would, oh no, uh, or people, wait a second, are you, did you really mean that? Do they deserve that? Are there people or groups that you would be reluctant to share the good news with? Hopefully the answer is no, but if we're honest, we might go, maybe, but of course I would go. And so that's what Peter is being called to do, is to go to a group of people that he doesn't want to have anything to do with. What's also interesting is Peter has seen Jesus interact with a Roman centurion who he says has had more faith than anyone else in Israel. He's seen the Samaritan woman in that whole experience. So Peter has at least witnessed it, and now it's Peter's chance to step up and do what God asks. So in verse 17, the men arrive, they knock at the door, and they say, hey, we were sent by this guy. Um, will you come and visit us up in Caesarea? And so Peter's like, okay, here we go. I just got this vision. Now it's starting to make a little sense. I will go with you, and let's see what God has in store. Remember Peter doesn't know what God is going to do here, except he probably knows I have the opportunity to share with these individuals. So the next day, Peter didn't wait. You know, he said, okay, maybe, uh, you know, I'm finally going to sit down. Let's have some dinner. Let's uh, get a good night's sleep, and then let's head off because it's a bit of a journey. The next day, Peter started out with them, and some of the believers from Joppa went along. So some of the, the followers of the way, they're like, okay, I want to see what this is up you know, what's going on here too. And so they're going to be challenged as well. So there's many individuals in this story that are going to have their understanding just blown to the max, okay? The following day, he arrived at Caesarea. Cornelius was expecting them and had called together his relatives and close friends. Now you understand why I asked that first question, what would you do? He knows something awesome is going to happen. He has no idea what it is. He is trusting God that it is going to be from God, and he brings together everybody he knows to make sure they can experience this. Isn't that how we're supposed to be when we're on God's mission? As Peter entered the house, Cornelius met him and fell at his feet in reverence. Okay, once again, Cornelius doesn't have an idea who Peter is. He just knows he's a messenger, and he kind of understands just from his pagan thinking, maybe he's a god I'm supposed to worship him, okay? There's something going on there. But, you know, Peter's like, wait a second, stand up. I'm just a man like you. I'm only a man myself. While talking to him, Peter went inside and found a large gathering of people. He said to them, you are well aware that it is against our law for a Jew to associate with or visit a Gentile. All right, so I'm sure some of you are familiar with the Dale Carnegie book, How to Influence People, right? This is not how you would start. By the way, you're a bunch of disgusting, impure people. I shouldn't be hanging out with you. No, that's not the icebreaker you usually want, okay? But that's how he starts out, just... I'm not supposed to be here, but when God says go, I go. So you're well aware I'm not supposed to be here because God has shown me that I should not call anyone impure or unclean. So Peter's kind of starting to get it in that journey. He was trying to figure out, oh yeah, so these guys show up. I'm supposed to go talk to the centurion. Ah, okay. So when I was sent for, I came without raising any objection. May I ask why you sent for me? So Cornelius goes through the whole thing. Hey, you know, three o'clock, I get this vision. I'm supposed to go find you. I sent my three men. Here you are. Thanks for coming, okay? Peter then has this opportunity to share the gospel message. Remember, they don't have the complete understanding of God, and they definitely don't seem to understand who Jesus is. And now Peter has this open opportunity. And we know he likes to preach in the book of Acts. So it's one of his shortest little sermons, but he has some beautiful phrases in there. One is, good news of peace, through Jesus Christ has come to this earth. Good news of peace. What do we call the peace of Rome right now? Philip? Pax Romana, the peace of Rome, which is peace through force, power, might. How does the peace of Jesus Christ come? 
through love, through caring, through graciousness. And so he gives this Roman centurion who is, you know, obviously working to keep the peace and helps him understand that the true peace has arrived. And then I love this final statement he gives here in 43. All the prophets testify about him that everyone who believes in him receives forgiveness of sins through his name. Would Peter have necessarily said that to a Roman centurion a week before this? I don't know. But he has, he's all in right now. God has done this. He sees it. The pieces are coming together. Now, is Peter going to screw up again with another short chapter with regards to this topic? Yes. Okay, he's not all the way there yet. But this shows that he's come a long way. Forgiveness has come to all who call on the name of Jesus. Everyone who calls on the name of Jesus can be forgiven no matter how bad, no matter what you've done, no matter how you look at yourself and how you identify yourself. If you call on the name of the Lord, you will be forgiven. And so here's the amazing thing that happens. And we continue to see these little pieces that enforce, here we go, this is something new. It's not just for the Jews, it is for all people. Verse 44, while Peter was still speaking these words, the Holy Spirit came on all who heard the message. We don't know how. It obviously doesn't sound like the fire and wind of Pentecost. Is it like the dove that came on Jesus at the baptism? We don't know, but the Holy Spirit came on, and they know that because the circumcised believers who had come with Peter were astonished that the gift of the Holy Spirit had been poured out even on the Gentiles because they started speaking in tongues like in Acts 2 at Pentecost, okay? Now, whenever you receive the Holy Spirit, you're not going to speak in tongues. That's not how the thing always worked back then. But in this case, do you see what Luke's doing? I opened up this loop with the Jewish Christians receiving the Holy Spirit and speaking in tongues. And now that we've kicked off the Gentile conversion, if you will, with Paul to come soon, now they're getting the Holy Spirit and speaking in tongues. It's the same for everybody is the point. Yeah. Peter, you get it. Gentiles, Jews, it doesn't matter who you are. And so even the believers he brought were astonished and amazed. And, you know, their world is thrown upside down too. They're challenged. So surely no one can stand in the way of their being baptized with water. They have received the Holy Spirit just as we have. So he ordered that they be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. Then they asked Peter to stay with them for a few days. Peter's world has just been thrown on in. And he has gone into that new world graciously. Let's even baptize them. This is an amazing time. And he stays with them. And I'm sure he continues his gospel message and helps fill in the blanks and helps them truly understand who Jesus was. Because Peter of all the disciples, truly knew who Jesus was and his forgiveness of sins. And so he had a lot to share with them. And so once again, I ask you, you know, where do you go? Who do you go to? What do you do when things are just completely thrown on in? It's been four months, right? Things have been thrown on in. But as Jerry Shute said today in our study of Mark, isn't it you that said, isn't this an opportunity? opportunity too. Our world's been thrown on in, but it's given us an opportunity to live stream to 30, 40 people a week. This singing, this worship, a message about Jesus. The opportunities are there. New things, making masks to share with hospitals and places like that, serving in unique ways. The opportunities are there for us to continue sharing with our words and our actions. And so a couple points of reflection, and these are pretty powerful. So when your world is in turmoil, there is one constant. Hebrews 13, 13, 8 tells us, Jesus Christ is the same when? Yesterday, before this all happened, today, and forever. God, Jesus Christ, do not change. It even says in Revelation, I'm the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. Be everything, always here. This timeline that we're in is just for us, so we can kind of understand what's going on. God is outside of that timeline. He is with us, and he does not change. He is the creator, the loving God, the one who sent his son. He is the almighty. And so our question then, knowing that we worship the one who is constant, 
and constantly with us? Who is God calling you to share the good news with? Where is God calling you to go? What circumstance? Which individual might he be calling you to go? Maybe somebody uncomfortable. Is he pushing you? And how are you going to share that good news? And what does it sound like? Tom? Thank you, Scott. I want to share also that I believe the Holy Spirit works. And he's been working on certain hearts and minds this week. Um, and so as we stand and get ready to sing this song, let me uh, encourage us that this song has a message, and that message, in the context of what we've done today, that message is shareable. So let's praise God with it, but let's be ready to share it. Let's stand. Here we go. Say a closing prayer. Father God, in the name of Jesus, we come before you thanking you for everything you've done for us, thanking you for this message. Thank you for writing the spirit of this message and the truth of this message in our hearts in the name of Jesus. We thank you for just keeping us protected. We thank you for this church congregation. We thank you for all that you have done, are doing, and are doing. We call forth more of your spirit into our lives, more of your love, more of your grace, more of your mercy, more thankfulness for everything that you are and everything you do. In the name of Jesus, we, we love you. We praise you, Father God. We love you, Jesus. Thank you for being our Savior. Thank you for all that you are. And in Jesus' name we pray.